So I'm Charles Stewart, and welcome. Um, I'm a um, political scientist um, from MIT, and, and today I'm going to be um, talking um, along with my um, friend and colleague, Elsie McLaughlin, who's a local election official, um, about um, some polling place um, tools and resources that are online. Um, in my day job, I'm a professor of political science at MIT, and I'm also the um, co-director of the Caltech MIT um, Voting Technology Project. And um, the first um, part of our conversation is um, just me talking a bit about the background of some tools that we have online that are available for um, election officials and others to use to help to allocate um, resources like um, poll books and voting booths to um, polling places. And then Allison has had some experience um, using these tools and um, we'll have a chance to talk a bit about um, what um, people in the field um, happens, um, what happens with them when they actually um, use the tools. Um, so let me just say a few words about the tools that we've made available and what the background is. Um, if um, you go to the website and you go to the um, um, Voting Technology Project website at web.mit.edu slash VTP, um, you will see a website um, that serves up these tools. Um, let me just say a word about the background of the tools. The tools were really the brainchild of um, the bipartisan Presidential Commission on Election Administration in 2013. The um, commission, of course, had um, been created in order to um, you know, address a number of election administration issues, but particularly long lines had been a um, had been an issue in 2012. And the commission asked the Voting Technology Project if we could put together certain tools um, that could be used by election officials to apply technologies to the issue of, of, of long lines and um, with the purpose of the tools being to give um, um, election administrators an insight into the proper allocation of these resources in order to, to manage lines appropriately. So what we did was we um, really, we have three tools on our website. I'd like to highlight two of them. Um, one of them was written specifically for the website by a colleague of mine at MIT named, his name is um, Steve Graves and his graduate student, Rong Wan, um, put together a um, put together a tool that's really old school. Um, it relies on some very simple inputs about the number of voters um, showing up during a day, um, the number of resources like polling um, booths or, or poll books, um, and the amount of time it takes in order to do the basic task in a polling place, like cast a ballot or mark a ballot or check in a voter. Um, and we can actually think about that tool as essentially a spreadsheet, um, which allows election officials very quickly to get a really broad view of what's going on in the district. There's another tool that's based on um, computer simulation that was written by a computer scientist in Illinois named um, Mark Pelzarski. And this tool allows um, officials really to drill down into the dynamics of, um, of a polling place during the day, taking very similar information um, to the more old school um, um, tool, but also adding information about the dynamics during the day so that um, you can see basically what happens, say, if you have a big rush of voters at the beginning of the day or the end of the day, and it allows um, officials really, as I said, to, to kind of drill down. Um, so, you know, the, just to say a, a, a bit more of a word about these tools before um, turning it over to Allison. The um, Graves One tool, um, as I said, is um, very simple and very straightforward. And it just takes as input um, information about arrivals of voters at a precinct. Um, so this is information that all election officials have, how many people vote during the day. And you divide that by the number of hours the um, polling place is open, and you have the arrival rate. And you add in the number of voting booths or poll books you're interested in to see if they'll work and um, um, how long it takes to do the basic task you're analyzing, like um, checking in a voter. Um, and you can just basically enter that data into the screen, hit calculate, and the output of the tool um, tells the official 
um, how long they should expect voters to have to wait um, in order to uh, receive service at a particular place in a polling in a polling place. So there's a very kind of very simple um, um, interface there, which can be complexified. Um, with a spreadsheet that you can also download and that's associated with the tool. So if you want to analyze up to a thousand um, precincts in a county, say, in a very large county, um, you can do that. Um, and so that's kind of um, a tool that gives one a broad view of the county. The so-called Pelzarski tool is the one that's based on a simulation and it's, a, it's visually compelling um, in that it can help election officials see um, what the time dynamics of wait times might be given when voters ar arrive and given how many poll books um, you might have in a precinct, given how many, um, say, voting booths you might have. And um, I'm displaying, for instance, um, um, here a, um, an example where we have, on average, 100 voters showing up every hour, but there's a really kind of a spike at the end of the day. Um, and there's a yellow um, 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 figure on the graph that shows um, how long wait times would be in order to say to check in. Um, and we can, we can um, manipulate um, this tool to change the number of, of, of um, um, poll books or the number of, of um, voters arriving and, and various parameters and we can see how that would change the dynamics during the day. So, so these are very um, basic tools. Um, they um, have instructions on the website. Um, they, at the very least, they're very easy to play with, I think. And um, there are videos and instructions to help um, the user, um, meaning the election official, to um, dive in and um, to begin to use them. Um, but I know that um, Alison has actually used them, and we've talked about this before, and um, I was hoping that she could first introduce herself and then um, say a bit, talk a bit about um, um, the work that you've done, that we've done together in trying to apply these tools in Montgomery County, where, where you're from. My name's Allison McLaughlin, and I'm the Deputy Director of Elections in Montgomery County, Maryland. I've been an election official now for about seven years in the Washington, D.C. area. And we have long lines. We have them in every presidential general election. Um, and really the great thing that we've seen about these tools is that they've been a good way for us to pull together the case for what we need to change in order to have shorter lines as we move forward in elections. The, the great thing about these tools is that they're really a start. We knew when the Presidential Commission on Election Administration set the bar at 30 minutes that we were going to really struggle to bring our wait times down to the standard of 30 minutes in our jurisdiction. We knew that we do not have enough equipment to achieve that. We knew that we really, it's gonna take many years to undo years worth of polling place consolidations that have led us to the point we are where we just have a, a norm of very long lines. But in order to get to shorter lines, we can't just throw a ton of money at the process. We really need to be able to identify which polling places need more equipment, which polling places need more people, which polling places need to be split. And in having that dialogue within our own office, with our state, with our policymakers, and with others around the field, we really need to be able to pin down and have a better common language among election officials about what our needs are and what it's going to take to get where we need to go. What we decided we wanted to do as soon as these tools became available and we started playing with them, the Pelzarski tool really was the one, the, the, it's called the line optimization tool. When you go to the website and click on them and try them, it quickly gives you a, a great visual that sh shows you exactly what we know, which is that lines are not an all day long thing in most of our polling places. In our case, we know that our lines are first thing in the morning. But to really tell the story of how long our lines will be, we were able to start plugging in some numbers and, and test some assumptions. But the great thing about these tools is that they're really a starting point. And so for us, as soon as we started plugging in numbers, we had questions. We started saying, well, which of these choices really applies to us? And how do our numbers align with the assumptions that are in these tools? And so it, it really opened the door for this then to reach out to Charles Stewart and to say, well, we've started using these tools and here's what we're finding. What do you recommend? How do we make these tools apply to this specific scenario that we're trying to test for? 
and it led to really some great back and forth and discussions. It, it's one thing to say as election officials that we don't have enough equipment, that we want to have this many more scanners. It's another thing to be able to say, well, we've been talking with MIT, and MIT <laughs> says that we need to have this many more scanners in order to really avoid having lines over a half an hour at a polling place. Um, and so with the, with the Pelzarski tool in particular, once we start plugging our information in, and then we go to Charles Stewart, and Charles says, well, what number are you using for how long you think your voters are going to take to wait in line? And he says, well, okay, well, when we were monitoring line lengths in Fairfax County, which uses the same equipment that you have, here's what we found. And then we were able to take those numbers and test under some slightly different assumptions what it would really look like if voters take longer to mark their ballot or if voters take less time to mark their ballot. Begin to develop some common understanding of, of really how long we should assume your average voter is going to take to mark their ballot and to, to show in a, in a clear, widely used model how long it takes for voters to mark their ballot and how many pieces of equipment we need to have in a polling place. It's also been a good way for us to share that dialogue with other election officials around the country to get together with our peers and to begin to develop some common methods. We have begun in the last few elections measuring how long it takes voters to check in in the morning, uh, handing out a card and writing down what time it is when that voter uh, arrives at the back of the line and then what time that voter checks in when they get to the front of the line. We discovered that some of our peers are um, writing down how many people are in that line and so we added that to our card that we're distributing at polling places and we're beginning to measure the same things that our peers are measuring in other counties around the country and that's there's really no substitute for being able to to speak the same language and build a strong case that that looks like what we're trying to communicate to policymakers and to those who fund our elections for how much equipment we need and and where we need to send it We've been um, testing our assumptions. We all, every county has different processes for how we decide how many voting machines we're going to send somewhere, or how many scanners, or how many, um, how many check-in stations we have at a polling place. And so using these tools and, and having a dialogue with our peers and having a, a dialogue with political scientists and others about how we use these tools is really helping us to develop a, a common language, a common case for what we're, what we're doing and what we're seeing in the polling places. One of the things I would definitely say to new election officials is that there's really, data-driven democracy is, is not really about some killer app or a best practice. It's really about, there's no substitute for sitting down with your own data and knowing your data and being able to build some longitudinal data about what you've seen in your polling places over time to narrow down where the trouble spots are for you to apply and, and talk to experts in the field like Charles Stewart about. And so we're, we're really glad to be part of this dialogue and glad to be able to use these tools. Um, one of the things that you mentioned, you, you reminded me of the dialogue and the back and forth we had about um, what parameters you were putting into the model. And this re reminds me that um, um, a, a point that you made about gathering data and, and creating data over time is really an important part here. Um, you know, these tools don't require a whole lot of data, but they re do require some things. And as um, you know, we've discovered, um, you know, it, it, it requires maybe to know how long your lines are, how long it takes to do a couple of things, but it doesn't require a lot. But you do need a good basis for some of these estimates. So for instance, um, how long does it take to check in a voter? Um, one of the things that I've noticed is um, when I talk to election officials and I ask them, well, how long does it take to check in a voter? And they'll say, well, about a minute. Well, do you mean 50 seconds or do you mean 70 seconds or do you, do you mean 60? And sometimes, you know, just a matter of seconds can really make or break a precinct. Um, and I'm wondering um, what you've discovered as you've played with the tools in terms of just tweaking things a, a small amount. The tools are an approximation. Mm -hmm. Really, we, yeah. we see that the 8 a.m. voter doesn't take the same amount of time to cast their ballot as the 2 p.m. voter. And the uh, voter at the senior center doesn't necessarily take the same amount of time to cast their ballot as the voter at the elementary school. And so really the value for us in 
in that particular part of the model where you need to plug in how long you think the voter is going to take is in starting with a number that we sort of treat as the constant of what is going to be the same in our county and in some other mm -hmm. county and then to see the relative differences among our polling places when you put that assumption in. As we begin to develop more uh, measurements of what we see in the polling places, I'm sure that we'll reach the point where we can get more fine-tuned about what data we plug in for which polling place, mm -hmm. but we're not really at that point now, and right. so for us, we start with the number that Charles tells us he's seeing <laughs> in other counties, right. so that we're using the same data as, as you're seeing everywhere else. Right. Right, and but and and I take it as um, is a good sign that you've made a commitment really to doing this over time, and you know, getting, as you say, maybe things will settle down. But my my sense is what um, what what you'll also see is you know, a presidential year is going to be one set of numbers, and a small special election for a state rep is going to be another set of numbers. But just committing to recording and keeping track and comparing over time, um, you know, that's really the value in in, in using these sorts of tools in the long run, it kind of disciplines um, um, your observation of the polling places. That's great. The presidential general election, or really any high turnout election, is where we know everyone's going to be watching. Right. So we have some data that we can go back to, but at this point we are building the tools to really be able to measure the experience because we know that we're going to have issues in a presidential general election, we always do. But to be able to substantiate exactly what they were is, is really very important for us. You, you hear a lot of rumors, oh, lines were an hour and a half somewhere. Well, and maybe they were, but maybe that's also an exaggeration. And so where we have measured the lines on the hour every hour, we can at least support or refute the accusations that maybe the lines were not as long as they're being described as, or maybe we had a really serious problem in that polling place and we need to make sure that we substantiate that and fix that. In our case, we used the presidential primary election this time to test a new way of, of measuring what the lines were. And what was really gratifying for us was to see that poll workers really want to be part of the solution. We developed this, we had a commitment to handing out a card and, and measuring the lines at least first thing in the morning where we always know that we have longer lines. But we reached the conclusion very close to the election that, that we were going to try to measure the lines throughout the day on the hour every hour. But we were introducing new voting equipment. We had a lot of new things that we were throwing at our poll workers in this election. So we didn't want to make them do one more thing, one more checklist, one more form. We made it optional. We gave them an orange card. We said, here is this tool. If you want to be part of our effort to measure what the lines are and to be able to share with others what the experience was on election day, it would be great if you would hand this out at the beginning of the day, if you would hand it out once an hour on the hour. And over 90% of our polling places, it, it happened. Over 90% of our chief election judges, our, our poll workers in the polling places, decided that this was really important to them to be able to give back to us the information for us to be able to support for them what happened and what their experiences and needs really were. And um, you've made a really um, um, interesting point that I've noticed in working with other election administrators is sometimes they, um, it, um, for you there must be some trepidation in asking um, your poll workers to do something new. Um, but you know they're very dedicated in, to the um, enterprise and they, and they want to do it right and they worry about the process as well. And it's really um, quite touching and in some ways amazing, we should have known this, that oftentimes when you ask the poll workers to do something like this, to, to, to measure in the polling places, they're very eager to help because they recognize that this can make things better. And um, um, I've noticed there's been less resistance than I think um, I would have guessed. Um, another thing that you said that I think is um, really, um, really interesting is that you mentioned doing some new things in a, um, an election that's going to have a lower turnout, I mean the presidential preference primary, um, much lower than the general election. Um, but this would seem to give you a chance to kind of try things out um, and not just to wait to when you know there's going to be long lines all day long, but just to try it out when you know you might have little long lines every now and then and give people a chance to maybe make some mistakes and not quite do it right and kind of practice before you know, kind of the big show happens in November. It, it's great to test tools in a lower turnout election, but 
it's really, sometimes you can toss a new tool or a, a new pilot project at poll workers in a, in a high turnout election, in a presidential general election, and get less resistance than you might have expected. Because I really do think that the poll workers want to be part of something. It's too late typically in, in July or August of a presidential general election to throw a whole lot of new things at your poll workers. But this is the kind of thing that you can really decide just a few months before an election or a few weeks or days before an election mm -hmm. that you are going to make a commitment to do, that you're going to measure your lines once an hour on the hour or whatever the frequency is that works for you, even if you do make it optional and give your poll workers the opportunity to measure that for you. It was gratifying to us to see that they were really, really eager and happy to participate in that. Right. So we improve elections and we empower poll workers to make the process even better. Which, is, which is just great to do. Great. Yeah. So I'd like to, um, I'd like to thank um, you for, um, for watching um, this, um, um, this broadcast about the use of the polling place tools and um, would like to just invite you, if you want to learn more, to visit a couple of websites. Uh, First of all, um, supportthevoter.gov is the website for the um, um, Presidential Commission on Election Administration. And in addition to the report, there's a link there to the tools I've been talking about. If you want to go directly to the tools, the other website is web.mit.edu slash VTP. And there you can get access to the tools and the videos and the other instructional other instructional materials. And um, I'd also like to, to thank um, um, as well um, Alison um, for, um, for um, being here today, talking um, this through, and being one of the many, many um, election administrators um, um, around the country who are serious about this, um, serious about data, serious about um, kind of improving performance through data and um, making things better for voters on election day. So together I, you know, I hope that we as academics and um, forward-looking election administrators can um, bridge some divides that sometimes exist and really work um, together for the betterment of our democracy. So thank you. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to thank the Election Assistance Commission for hosting this discussion and, and so many others. Uh, as we're all working on these issues together. And I'd, I'd really like to thank Charles Stewart for being a, a constant presence and a, a close friend of election officials across the country. The time that you put in to working with election officials is really just invaluable for all of us. And thank you so much for being there, for being a friend, and for being a resource to all of us. Well, you're welcome. Thank you.